There we go. Okay. All right. So welcome everyone. Um, my name is Dan. I am the Director of Development Programming for the Bedford Playhouse. Uh, hopefully you guys can all hear me now. Uh, I want to thank everybody for coming uh, on this summer-like evening to spend a few minutes with us um, as part of the Let's Talk series. Um, for those of you who have joined us or for those of you who haven't joined us before, um, this is really a cornerstone program of the Bedford Playhouse. We're very, very proud to uh, be able to do this on a monthly basis and provide some information and resources that we think uh, are useful for folks, um, especially as we uh, are emerging from uh, the period of COVID-19. Um, as people are coming in, we're going to give it just a, one more minute, but I want to just uh, ask that you, over the course of the conversation, I'm going to introduce um, uh, our moderator and our special guest in a moment, uh, that you please use the Q&A feature, which you can find at the bottom of your screen. There's a little Q&A button to um, ask your questions. You can post a question at any time. Uh, there'll, be, uh, there'll be some time um, allocated towards the uh, end of the, the presentation uh, to take your questions. Uh, and we really want uh, people to ask questions as, as much as possible um, to engage. Uh, that's what this program is really designed to do. Um, but please use the Q&A feature uh, rather than the chat feature, just it's a little easier for us to keep track and we want to try to get to as many of those questions as possible. Uh, the good news is that uh, the Bedford Playhouse is reopening. Uh, finally, after 14 months of our doors being shut, uh, we have uh, this weekend uh, a series of curated classics. Uh, we're doing Philadelphia Story, Rear Window, The Graduate, and The Sting in rotation. Um, you can find more information about that on our website. And then we are reopening with First Run Films next weekend, the following weekend. Uh, we have A Quiet Place 2, um, and we actually also have a great uh, uh, film called Dream Horse, uh, which we'll be running. Uh, that's actually also opening this weekend, too, uh, which is a really great story. Um, you might find that interesting. A lot of this stuff, again, is all on our website. Um, and so we just ask that you check that out, and if you are so inclined, uh, please consider making a donation. We are a 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, most of our um, programming is supported by the community. We really can't do it uh, without your help. And if, you're, if you like what you've seen tonight and you would like us to do more like it, uh, any contribution is welcome and appreciated and it's also tax deductible. Uh, so with that being said, uh, I wanna welcome uh, Vanessa Smith, who's our moderator for the evening. Come on down, Vanessa. Hello. Okay. And uh, also, uh, Dr. Judy Tannenbaum. Judy, unmute. There's always, there's always one time during a Zoom call, everybody says to unmute. There we go. We're awesome. Uh, Vanessa, it's your show. I'll let you introduce Judy, and uh, we'll see you on the other side. Great. Well, we're so delighted to have Dr. Judy Tannenbaum tonight. And if I read her entire resume, we'd be here for four weeks. So I'm going to read just a few things and then we're going to get going. Uh, Judith Tannenbaum is a, has been in private practice for over 28 years. She has been honored by the bequest of the Beth Tannenbaum Chair in Clinical Psychiatry, which was funded in perpetuity post-residency psychiatrists for further uh, to further their study in any clinical psychiatric area they chose. She is also the clinical assistant professor at Weill Cornell Medicine, clinical assistant professor in psychiatry at New York Presbyterian, and a member of the Dean Circle. Dr. Tannenbaum is currently on the board of visitors at Columbia University School of General Studies. She has a very, very impressive resume, which is on, on the website at, Bedf uh, at um, Bedford Playhouse. So without further ado, welcome Dr. Tannenbaum and please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just gonna make one small correction only. Um, the chair is an endowed chair, so it's um, not funded yet. So it will be, so it's to help people um, become better clinicians after residency. So there's a lot of um, funds for research, biologic research, but not nearly as many for clinical. So it was honored. Um, so thank you for having me. Um, um, as Vanessa said, I've been in practice for, it'll be 29 years in September. Um, my patients are in psychotherapy with me, with or without medications. 
And so I thought I would just briefly um, discuss my views of sort of life and psychotherapy and how I work. And so I think relationships with people are key in all areas. And so I sort of ironically use a pie model. And so I look at life like a pie and the crust of the pie is someone's self-esteem and no one has perfect self-esteem. So there are many areas that I, and the pieces that sit on top of the crust and the pie are family, like nuclear family, spouse or lover, someone has children, friends and work. And many people come to me uh, love relationships are probably most complicated because they most mimic parental relationships. But I see people sometimes who have areas of that pie that are they're having difficulties at work with their kids, with their spouse, or they don't have friends. So it just depends. But I definitely believe that healthy interpersonal relationships in all those areas make for a more content life, whatever that is defined by the patient. And so there are three things that I think make those interpersonal pieces of the pie healthier. Um, one is having a generosity spirit, which is doing for others without a checklist. It has nothing to do with money it's because you like to be a nice person and do for others and not holding a list that they owe you back. The ability to empathize with that person or people. And also most people in my office lack this as well as out of my office, it's like learning Chinese, which is the mindfulness of the impact one has on others. So it's less important in what you say, but how you say it. So anger is part of loving people or with work, and it's all about communication and how you say it so that you become sensitive to the impact you have on them. And often people are much more receptive to that. Um, so the, if those three things, and the hardest one is the mindfulness of the impact you have on others um, become in place, people will have healthier interpersonal relationships. If they're having marital difficulties, even if their spouse hasn't um, been in therapy, there's only one time in 29 years that I haven't seen this, there's often a positive domino effect. So as someone starts to change, the people in their life will respond positively and change. Um, also on my list that you have, um, I also believe that one has to pick their battles. And so when you want to discuss a difficult topic, and this was actually taught to be by my own shrink, and you should know I practice what I preach, which I feel saved my life truthfully. And so there's the basket model. So like, for instance, with raising children, basket one you must say something. And it changes, of course, during the age. But for me, safety and health was always in that basket. That was worth having an argument over. Basket three is like, you're going to let that one go. So if your daughter wants to take a dirty shirt out of the hamper and wear it to school, you're not going to have a power struggle about that. If they say, do you like this shirt? You could say, it looks cute, but I think it looks cuter, cleaner. Um, the harder one actually is the gray area, which is basket two. So do you make them take a bath? Do you make them do their homework? This And this basket model can apply to work. So if something occurs either with a colleague, a boss, anyone, you have to ask yourself, can I let this one go or is it worth bringing up? And if so, I'm now learning how to mindfully confront them. And so if you use that basket model, um, I often have seen people where parents make everything basket one, so they lose their authority. So if you're gonna have a power struggle about what clothes your kid's gonna wear when it comes time to curfews, everything's always a 10, so they don't really listen. So that's why it's worth picking. And that's true of friends, you know, because people are flawed, we're all flawed, um, deliciously so, but, um, it's important how you say it, but it's also important if it's worth saying. It's good to let things go if you can. As far as love relationships, as I said, they most mimic parental relationships. They're complicated because they don't only involve a friendship. They involve sexual relationship, 
often shared bunny. If people have children together, are you in the same book, the same chapter, different books? Some people feel like they're in different marriages. I feel that I call them the three C's for healthy, healthy relationships, but especially in love relationships, that um, caring for each other is actually very important and it would sort of fall under the umbrella of the generosity of spirit. But it's important to let your loved one know that you care for them. And so being a loving, caring person is important. And again, doesn't mean all the time, but that's important. Also, couples that don't communicate are in trouble. And so again, mindful communication is better. When I see couples that never have an argument, they may not care enough about each other to have an argument. And so those couples, I might say that they're in the marital ICU. And then also learning to compromise. And again, not with a checklist, but it's very important to um, give in sometimes and let that other person who you're with know that you're happy to, to compromise. You would have preferred A, but you're happy to do B. So you can see where these kind of things are all related. Um, and this, this list looks kind of simple, but it's much harder to put into practice. So when people come to see me, I'm incredibly, I call myself lovingly confrontational. So I can be incredibly empathic, very available. But if somebody just wants to blame everybody, then I'm not the right doctor for them because you can only change your part and when you change your part, again, there's often a domino effect. Um, as far as physical and emotional intimacy, I became um, more conservative having had a, one of my first patients in practice who was very comfortable with herself physically and sexually, and she could give of her body, but half of her at least was out of the room. So she wasn't emotionally connected, which left her being often rejected because people felt cold not close to her. And so it's because of her, and most people don't make it in this area in my office, I would say, I developed a six date rule where nothing below the waist for six dates. And so you can tell them you're incredibly attracted, but you want to get to know them first. Because more people have trouble getting close emotionally and making themselves vulnerable and opening themselves up. And so what happened initially with this particular person is, um, she kind of got it and it was before computers. So she would watch TV. So I had her put her TV away because if you want to meet somebody and you're alone, TVs are ha like having people there. So she read books and she stopped sleeping with people too early and often by the fourth date realized she didn't really like them. And so her self-esteem got a little better because um, in my opinion, and again, I sound old fashioned. So if you want a fling, have a fling. But if you want a relationship, um, it's, it's actually nice to know what somebody else likes to do for fun. And so being with somebody and talking and having great conversations and fun with them is actually intimate. As people age or they're on medication, intimacy, physical intimacy changes between couples. And so it's something ideally you do with that person only. And so that's what makes it so special in a way, but also something that you would want to protect. And so as people age, a famous psychiatrist, a Harvard professor who I love taking his lectures said, you know, as people are aging, intimacy changes. So you might hold hands more, you might cuddle more, you might kiss more, but everybody's libido goes down Unfortunately, the world is still, in my opinion, a little sexist. So they discovered Viagra. They haven't really worked on female sexuality as much. But one can be physically intimate, even if it's not like when you were 20. Um, I'm very big on condoms. And I have a lot of patients, women patients in my office who think if they're nice, they're safe, including doctors, which I kind of try to educate them about. And the last thing, and I think this is key to all relationships, is being truthful. And so truthfulness is the foundation of all relationships because um, if you can't trust what somebody is saying, um, when do you question if they're lying? And it's a good lesson to
to teach when kids are small because most kids lie. There's a great book for those of you who have teenagers. Um, I can't remember the author, unfortunately, but it's a great title. It's like, um, get out of my life, but first can you take Cheryl and me to the mall? And it's written by a psychologist and it's about how teenagers can be difficult and they can lie. But I think if people know that you don't lie and that you are truthful, then you don't have to question that because once people start couching things by omission or commission, it is very hard to um, know when, they're, when you're being lied to or not. And that can start young. And gratuitous truthfulness is not what I mean. So if you don't like someone's dress, I'm by no means suggesting to volunteer, I don't like your dress. However, if asked, do you like this dress on me? I'm mindful way to say, it's okay, it's not one of my favorites. So I don't believe in if somebody asks, you know, lying to make them feel good. Um, so that's kind of how I work psychotherapeutically in my office. So connecting the dots from people's childhoods. Um, sometimes I'll use more analytic phrases of transference if somebody's projecting their father onto me. But for the most part, it's interactive. It does look at people's past, present, what's going on in their life, I tend to be chatty. So I interrupt everybody trying to work on that in my personal and professional life. And so that's how I view life and sort of like the pie of relationships, which as those improve, um, most people are more content and get what, get what they want some more of the time and have less conflict. So that's kind of my pie of life. So I'm happy to answer questions, um, speak about any other parts of relationships, but that's how I work in my office, including how people relate to me. That, that's great because, you know, you're talking about navigation and that was that was a wonderful way to um, bring all these subjects up. I'd like to delve a little bit into how like the partners we choose kind of mimic what we've experienced as children, our family relationships and all of that. Would you like to comment on that? So it depends how psychologically aware people are. So yes, we are attracted to aspects of um, what we grew up with. Sometimes when people haven't um, worked through, nobody comes out to quote my own therapist of their childhood unscathed. And it's hard to be a person but if you're not introspective, sometimes people unconsciously will choose someone very similar to a more difficult parent in the hope that again, unconsciously, that if they can get the difficult parent, AKA spouse to love them properly, it validates them because when they're little, when you're little and you have a difficult parent, um, there's a great self-help book on daughters and narcissistic mothers, for instance, Kids really until age 13 or 14 don't have the ability to say, well, I'm lovable if my mom had struggled or my dad had struggled. And so they feel unloved. And so they unconsciously might pick somebody to rework their childhood to get somebody who isn't nice enough, et cetera. If they can transform them, um, it validates them. And then they're able to say, oh, it was my mom that wasn't loving. So many people do repeat that um it's kind of healing from your childhood so if people come to me before they meet that person they're going to end up with um i'm there to point out red flags i call them to like be like that sounds familiar but even in a marriage that might have difficulties one can still work through that with a couple or just with the person a, we have another question that's really about um, do we all kind of have one story we're all trying one kind of question or thing we're trying to solve in our lives from childhood do we have one trauma do we have one thing we're going towards can you speak to that that was one of the questions from the audience yeah i can try i don't think there is a universal one thing i think Interestingly, as an aside, because I do treat people who have mood disorders like depression and anxiety as well. So 
what's interesting is there are genetic studies where you inherit one set of genes from your father and one from your mother. And you can be a low risk for depression from both. You can be a hybrid. One parent is a high risk for depression and low, or you can be high, high. And under a quote, normal childhood trauma on what would be the X axis, nobody shows symptoms. In the middle range of trauma, the hybrid, the H, a high and low and the high, high start to show symptoms of depression and severe childhood trauma, everybody does. But I think the goal, um, not everyone has the same goals, not everyone has the same injuries. Um, there are red flags in my office um, when people say their moms are their best friends. In other words, there's a certain psychological emancipation that has to take place from when you're a baby to then you separate a little so you can go to school and those lines, you're still close to your family, but they're separated enough so you can go to camp or college. And then they become separated enough so that you can still be close. You're not in mesh. So you're not like two overlapping circles so that you have room to start that cycle over. And so I've treated 40 year old women who respond to their mothers when asked like, well, how'd you wear your hair on the date as if she was 14. And so it's also a developmental path. But I think each individual has their own set of what would make them content. Well, that's interesting because in a time of COVID, how is separation and the whole idea behind separation and how have we become individuated individuals? How has that been shaped? COVID has actually been interesting. Um, there's a 25% um, increase really of depression or anxiety due to COVID just the situation. Then if you had had COVID, there's also a huge incidence of depression and anxiety secondary to COVID. Um, couples have either done better or worse. I think everyone's kind of getting COVID crazy. There are people that no matter what you tell them or you educate them on the risks, they don't believe it. You could introduce them to Fauci and they wouldn't believe him either. Um, so there's a certain level of anxiety. Um, I know we call our home we work. Um, so my husband's in his then office being a lawyer and I'm here being a psychiatrist I'm telling psychiatry. Um, I think, um, again, it's become individual. I think you can be living with five people and still feel isolated. I also think um, people kind of hunkered in. So I used to in my old life, which feels 180 degrees from this life, I was never home. I worked all the time. And then I'd meet my friends during the week for dinner. And now, even though I've been going outside to restaurants since last summer, my desire to socialize was down. I think that everything felt just kind of burdensome. So some couples have actually spent more time together where they normally didn't. And so they've grown closer together. Others feel like you're driving me crazy and I have no privacy. So again, it's using those tools that I first talked about to talk. Couples that don't talk. I once treated a couple that had so much trouble that I had to see them individually and then kind of was the go-between for a while. And I felt like buying two of those little plants that you see. So if you take a plant and you use that as a symbol for a marriage, if you put it in the sun and you water it, and you prune it and take care of it, it tends to flourish. And that would be the care and compromise and communication. If you take the other one and you put it in the dark closet and you never water it and you never talk to it and you never, you know, never see sunlight, it actually dies. And marriages that aren't tended to don't do well. And so people may choose to stay together, but there's almost not a relationship. So Couples that actually don't ever argue mindfully are, in my opinion, in trouble. But it has to be mindful. So you can never take your words back, which is a big lesson I try to tell people that you cannot. Well, have you, what, 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 how, how does that work? Can you talk to us about that? Like, how does that work in therapy for you? Well, it's interesting. So most of the time in therapy, people relay what they say, or, and I may say, you could see where that was hurtful, or 
when people are angry, sometimes they say mean things like annihilate each other. On occasion in my office, I will be that, that person's object and they will speak to me that way. So I'm like, why do you need to speak to me in that manner? So in other words, you might, if it's coming directed at me, which Freud would have called transference, um, I still will use their behavior as a reflection to hold up a mirror. So, and teach them through that, the, the way in which you just said that is a hurtful way. And so um, most people talk about relationships in my office, either at work or difficulties or with their friends, or then if you outgrow your friends, what do you do about it? Um, so I think relationships, I think interpersonal relationships is what makes life rich. And we really, unless somebody doesn't have a need for relationships, um, and their best friend's a cat and they really have no close people in their life. Most people have people in their life. I do encourage, especially women, to have friends. I don't think one person, male or female, um, can make someone be everyone. And so it's important to have other people in your life. I think the other thing that happens for people who have children um, sometimes there's what's called splitting. And so often the moms would get thrown under the bus, but kids are smart and they learn how to conquer and divide. And so it's good to be a united front and then discuss those things privately. I also don't believe in burdening children with adult problems. And so if you happen to have a fight, they hear you, they see you make up, but I don't, I don't think it's anybody's business what that was about. So not speaking negatively, which was Oh, I'm sorry. No, that's a really great point. That is so important because a lot of our audience members have kids and it's how to have that divorce or that relationship happen. And then you also have parenting. Parenting is different, correct? And all of these things I call deliciously difficult. And so if parent A, let's say, says you're grounded, it's not okay for parent B to undo that without speaking to the parent and together you say we've decided but it happens all the time. And the other thing is if couples do decide to divorce, there's half of the, I'll call myself a shrink, so I'm gonna to refer to myself that way. Half the shrinks in the world are not for divorce. They believe you stay together for the kids no matter what. Then there's my half, which if done right, um, growing up in an unhappy house, I don't think is necessarily so healthy. And there are four things where if one was to get divorced, if these are in place, kids do well, which is, um, you don't, this is the one most people fail at. You don't speak badly about the parent, the divorced parent to the children. Um, people have a hard time with that. Socioeconomically between the two houses, it's pretty much equal. So it's not like a huge difference. Um, and both, parents ultimately, and the children can see this, that they seem more content. And also there's not a loss of a parent. So one doesn't pick up and move to Europe and never see them. And if those four things are in place, kids actually do well. I have, I have some patients who are wonderful co-parents, they're good friends, and they were terrible as a couple. And their kids turned out great. That's a, that's a great, great thing to talk about tonight. That's great. That's very helpful. I have a question about uh, that's come in from um, how to establish healthy boundaries. So this has to do with parenting and relationships, sex, everything. Due to COVID being together all the time with your partners, how does that really work? So I'm big on boundaries. Um, I don't think people should do. If somebody is reading somebody's texts, spouse, kids, um, there's a reason for that. So if it's spouses leaving each other's stuff, something's going on that's making them feel insecure. Um, I do think um, this world of social media, I think it's important to teach your children that what they put on social media um, is a billboard to the world. And thankfully I have a 29 and a half year old who we didn't really have to deal with a lot of this, just a little bit. It was more like Blackberry stuff. But, you know, Snapchat, people take pictures, teaching your kids not to put nude pictures of themselves online. Um, I think being respectful of your children um, 
when your kids are little, I mean, you say, how was school? You mostly get fine. The best way to learn from them is when you're tucking them in at night. That's tens when they want to talk. I think I very much do not believe in burdening children with adult problems. So between if you're having marital problems, work problems, it's okay to be kind of grumpy in a bad mood, but it's really not their business. And it's burdensome to be a parentified child. Um, I think you have to let your kid, if like teenagers, especially your kids know that if you have a reason to snoop or put spyware or the family cloud, I know people where they can see every keystroke, you know, you could say, if I have a reason to not trust you, which is why truthfulness is so important, you should know I have the ability to do this and I will let you know you're going to do this. And so, you know, the kids that put their phone at their friend's house and then they go out to a party. I'm also big, a big believer in consequences for stuff like that. So no how, threats. What do you think about consequences? How do you, how do you tell people in your practice? Go ahead, sorry. Oh no, sorry. That's okay. Sorry, I interrupt you. I'm a big believer in consequences. So first of all, every decision we all make, there are consequences, positive or negative. And so if I decided to post something to my old Twitter account, there could be consequences to that. Um, how you speak to somebody, what you decide to eat, how to exercise, not compromises. So if you think about it, every decision has consequences. This mostly comes up, I think, when parents are kind of too involved with kids' homework in high school. If kids' work ethic isn't really solidified by sixth, seventh grade, they may need some extra help. I've had parents who sit in the room and like read the biology book before the kids do. So the message is you're not smart enough to do this on your own. Um, so that would be a boundary, for instance. And the consequence of the choice, for instance, like with school is if you work a little harder, you might do better and have more options later. And I'm not a school snob, so I don't care where people go. But if you don't do your homework, there are consequences because you're gonna get in trouble in the school and you will have less options. I do not believe in, um, except on a rare, like if you want, if your kid needs a mental health day, I'm big on that, like once in a while. But if somebody's always late, I don't believe in calling the school and saying they're late because of something. Let them get in trouble at school. Because there are consequences to all of our decisions. Yeah. Do you think the do you think the pressures of this last year? I mean, I, I'd like to talk about like what's happened, but moving forward, what's going to happen moving out of this time of COVID, this intense time when people are going to be back in school. So, for example, is it going to be better? for parents who have been struggling with their marriage, with having kids at home, and everybody's looking at one another and all this stuff and you're seeing behaviors, is it, what's, what are you looking forward to? What are you anticipating? I don't know that there's one answer for that. So ironically, when I, the last time I was full-time in my office was March 5th. And I've been there, to, I love my office, but I've been there twice for five minutes. And so I'm thinking of reopening my office since more, most of my patients, I won't see anyone in person who's not vaccinated because I don't want to have psychotherapy in the mask. Um, but ironically, there's a lot of papers how people hated being locked up and now they're afraid to go back to work. But I think it just depends on the situation. So there's not a general situation. I think that there's probably, depends where people live, but there's trepidation as to is this safe, how careful to be, and even throughout this whole time, there was a range. My own theory as a doctor and sort of representative of public health is I didn't just worry about myself, but also I feel like I'm a representative to be a good role model. Um, I think social media, the one thing it's done is it's when Instagram first came out, which was probably about 15 years ago, I guess. And I remember thinking, who cares if I'm at Starbucks taking a picture of myself? And so what's happened is people are not as much into the community and protecting the community in which they live. And so last week, I think Dr. Fauci went to Cornell Medical School, but he was on television. He's like, you want to get vaccinated for yourself, for your loved ones, but also your community. And a lot of people don't care about their community. 
they feel like, well, if I'm okay, it doesn't matter if I'm exposing somebody. And that's actually long-term coming. I think that, um, again, in my experience empirically, I would say most, most couples have weathered this storm, so to speak, in some ways better. Because if you think about how lives are so busy, often people don't spend enough time together. But I also think kids, it's affected everyone at different ages. So two and three-year-olds have lost a year of their socialization. So a couple of people had pods of safe people, but for the most part, these kids are in mass. I know somebody who's three-year-old, she hasn't seen three-year-olds, so it's like delayed. And then I'm in my early 60s, it's like, wait, I'm spending my 60s locked up in my house, or you can't travel. Um, older people. So, and then learning online is very, very difficult for most people. Anyone who has a learning issue, they fall behind. So I know college kids who've taken gap year because they're like, I can't learn this way. Um, it's been quite difficult for most people between losing people, being worried about being sick, being locked up. Some people were acting out um and not behaving well and so um you know i can't say there's just one answer but i would say that every decade's been affected I mean, people yeah. miss proms and weddings and the loss and there's six hundred thousand people who've been killed basically in my opinion this was unnecessary i knew this in january and warned all my patients to get products and and so it's sad and there's, um, this is gonna be with us. This is not gonna be eradicated. And so it'll probably be like flu. And so I think right now, like people are out and about, but I think there's a lot of people who are frightened and cautious. Well, we're in this intermediate time too. I talked with a friend of mine I've known for 50 years and she doesn't see anybody and she has a major illness and she's not doing anything. So it's really, yeah, it's so interesting. Just, Sorry, go ahead someone is sick or immunocompromised, yeah. they, their CDC rules are very different. Yes. yes. They're not sure, for instance, um, some of the immunotherapies, for instance, like um, Crohn's, um, one of them, they're not sure they build antibodies to the vaccine. So they're actually drawing these. And the one thing, because these vaccines are new technology and they weren't studied as long, we don't know if you got what's called T-cell immunity, which gives you lifelong. So I had the measles. And if I were exposed to the measles, my T-cells tell my antibodies turn on, this is a bad thing. And because this vaccine, we needed it fast, they don't know if this confers T-cell immunity or not. And also the mutation so far, the vaccine seemed to cover most of them. Um, but no one knows. And then the long-term side effects of these vaccines have not been studied. And yeah. so I know a few people who are afraid to get the vaccine because they don't know that it won't harm them. Yeah. Educating people without shame that it's, that is true, but we do know how harmful COVID is. A question was just emailed in the, about um, the whole idea of awareness of health. For example, we are hyper aware of our mental health, our physical health, our proximity to other people, public, you know, just everything. How has that changed? Or what do you see? What would you like to comment about about that? I would I wish I could agree with you that people are hyper aware about their mental health. I think it's getting better. I think there's still stigmas. Um, in New York, I don't think it's a federal law, insurance companies. Um, might be federal, so I'd have to look it up. Um, psychiatrists were supposed to be on par with cardiologists, and there are people out there trying to make awareness of this. And because of the incidence of anxiety and depression around having to be quarantined, etc. cetera. Um, but I'm not sure. I wish people were more aware of their mental health and less ashamed to get help if they need it. There's so much anxiety and depression now that there are ads and hotlines, and I volunteered to be on the state for people who can't afford treatment. Um, many people are aware of the physical health. I think many people live in denial. The obesity in this country is humongous. Um, 
So I think what's happened is as far as COVID, people became some terrified actually of getting it, understandably. And, you know, it's not an equitable distribution. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, and the access to good health care. Yeah. Th this is not a fun disease to have. It's not yeah. just your lungs, which can, is due to an overreaction of your immune system called a cytokine storm, cytokine storm. But it can cause renal failure, diabetes, strokes, heart attacks, limb loss, any vascular disease. Yeah. So it's not a happy virus to have. Yeah. Well, not related to COVID, but what are what are you some of do you have the most what's the most interesting question you've ever been asked in therapy? Someone's come in. What's the most? I mean, it could be anything. So I tend to be somebody who shares about myself if it's relevant. So I'm not, you can tell I'm not quiet. Um, that is a good question. I would say one of the most hostile things that was ever told me early in my practice was by a patient who asked me how old, like a more traditional psychiatrist, if you said, do you have children? I may not answer. Or they may say, what do you think? Which can tell you something about them. I would say, yes, I have one. Um, but somebody wished my daughter at the time, who was probably two or three dead. And how I handled that then versus how I'd handle that now is very different. So she said, I would imagine you might find that hostile and have to talk to your own therapist about it. It was very hostile and kind of took my breath away. Somebody, if somebody said that to me now, I would say that's probably the most hostile thing you could wish for me. And I'm not sure I can get past it to be able to help you. So I don't know what the name is. Um, I don't know that I've been asked anything that has stumped me. I think um, sometimes I joke I get paid to get yelled at. And so it helps that I grew up in a house where it was okay to be angry, so I'm not afraid of it. But um, on occasion, as my therapist used to teach me, when you're, this therapy evolves over time and you spend a long time there, what you talk about changes. Um, but I was really being yelled at. Um, by a high functioning person. And he said, when you're in a canoe with somebody and they're trying to tip you over, you hold on for dear life. And so also I would never send or go to anyone of any field in therapy, social work, psychologists, psychiatrists who hadn't been in therapy themselves. Because we're just people. And if, you're, if my own buttons are getting pushed and I'm not aware of them, then I would be acting out in that session. Yeah. And it's interesting because it's all about questions. This is what, by the way, you're such a perfect, perfect guest for Let's Talk because it's all about asking questions. And it's all about finding out. So it's great. That's great. I want to ask you what what if you were to go if you were to um, go in today, you'd never been in therapy. What 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 would be the first thing that you would expect, or or if, what would you what would be the first thing you would expect a couple coming to you if someone had cheated? This comes from a. This comes from someone you know very well. If someone's cheated, what do you do with that? Sorry. So again, twenty some years ago, how I handled that now is different. So often, if a couple comes to me, I see the couple, and then I may see them individually. Um, I don't disclose that. I think twenty five years ago, I had that person disclose that. Um, people. This sounds, this kind of sounds stereotypical. Men, when they cheat, often just want another sexual experience where women, if they're cheating, it's often because they're unhappy and have a relationship. Um, I happen to think those relationships can recover, but never the same. So it's sort of like if you took, if you were building a house and the foundation, you cracked it, the cement was cracked, you might be able to seal it over, but eventually the crack comes back. So the trust is broken. So it's hard, it is hard to recover. You can, but I'm not sure that that trust is ever there, ever there. or people who are married from an affair where they each had one or wounded. There's always that hint, like, is this person gonna do that again or am I gonna do that again? And so I think if you get to the point where, and most people, there are many few people in the world so people are gonna be attracted to other people. But if you get to the point where you're close to that, better to deal with it before you get yourself in a mess. That's interesting, very interesting. What do you think, why, why do people get married? 
Why do people want to well, be that's married? That's kind of an interesting question because what comes up in my office is more younger people want to get married often if they want children and it falsely in some ways gives them a sense of security as the divorce rate I think after 1990 or something is 60 percent it's huge so people don't often work on their marriage. marriages like children are deliciously difficult um and there are many times where you feel like Ugh, what am I doing in this marriage which I think is normal um, where it comes to be a problem is in a second marriage or somebody my age wants to get married, like, do you need to get married? Because then it becomes partly a business deal if there's any finances involved and prenups and do you take care of each other and what's going to happen when you're gone and kids and all that stuff. Um, I've come across a lot of therapists I know who, or people I know who, spend three or four nights with their monogamous significant other, but they keep their separate houses and they don't want to. They like having that space, which reminds me of something else. It's very important that couples also aren't enmeshed so that you have overlap. And what do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? Well, enmeshed? It's sort of like where the person has no space, no boundaries or each other, it's just human respirators. And it sets a person up to one of them to feel rejected. So if somebody wants to read the New York Times, they could feel like, well, you're not paying attention to me. So it's very important to have overlapping interests so that you have fun together, whatever that is, but also to have your own interests or some of your own friends and go to lunch with people so that you have a more full life so that you're not just relying on one person to fulfill all your needs. But it is a big conflict in later in life when couples in their 50s, 60s, do they, some wants to get married, some don't, you know, why not, um, that kind of thing. Well, and you've refer, you referred to this, that not one person can't give you everything, but do you find that, I mean, this is maybe not the right way of asking it, but do men or women find more friendships, outlets, different ways of being with people that helps, that can potentially help a marriage or help a family? Or would you like to discuss that? I, would, I mean, I would say in my experience, both in my office and out of my office, I think typically, and again, this is typically, women tend to be more social. Um, often men find other outlets and aren't as social. I always tell people that there's only one planner in the family, which is fine. Like some people will be like, well, he never makes the dinner reservation. It's like, does he have, do you have fun when you go out? It's like, yes. So it's like, what difference does it make if you're the one making the reservation or anything else that you want to do? Um, I, this is gonna, I hope I don't offend anybody. I think women multitask better. So when I try to um, impart as far as wisdom, is that it is not worth fighting over that you do, the female does 80 or 85% of lots of stuff, even if you work out of the house, in the house, being appreciated. Doctor, there's Dr. Stahl, who's the guru of psychopharmacology, um, used to say, if you, if you wanna know who the man fathered, speak to him. If you wanna know what's going on in the house, you speak to the woman. And so, I tend to find that even if you work outside the house, we're just better organizers at multitasking. And, and how, that's, that's great. And also how do blended families work with all this? How do blended families make it all happen? So again, there's not a universal answer. In an, in an ideal world, um, people would be co-parents and not threatened by the ex. So a lot of families, actually my late brother did this, he and my sister-in-law, who I'm, his ex-wife, who I'm close to, um, they would bring their significant others and my niece would be there and was, they were friends. It's very difficult on the kids if um, they feel cold. And so, but again, there's not like a, a universal answer for how that works. I have a I have a bunch of uh, divorced friends and I would always just with my son, we have one son, I would just go wherever the kid was 
we go to the we go to the mother or the father or the whatever and we i would just kind of follow the kid and i felt that that was kind of a better way of doing it for everybody you're asking like who do you stay friends with if one of your friends gets over? um but when your son gets older he probably he may not have wanted you to join him on it he'll choose right and he'll choose whatever i but i have one more uh, another question that just came in that is about um what happens if you and your partner are living completely separate lives but you're okay you're roommates what do you do do you stay do you should you stay i mean how many people have you seen get divorced actually or how many people have you helped navigate through all this yeah it's funny. there's a big review that um now that, that people review doctors, so people use that as a weapon, where somebody said on the first couple session, I said they should get divorced, which is false. Um, I've told two people in 28 years that I thought it was time. One couple was literally beating themselves up. So I was like, if you can't do this for yourselves, you should do this for your children. And the other really was five years of couples therapy and they just, we kind of all just agree. Um, many people live like that like roommates. So the question is, are you roommates because there's no sexual activity or you just kind of live together but you don't do anything together? Um, often people stay together in those situations because it's just easier, sometimes financially, but often they're both lonely. It's like a lonely situation. So if you're friends and living like that, but if you're just like living with your roommate and you use my yogurt, um, it's depriving. Most of those people aren't content. Why they stay together could be a lot of reasons. Some people don't believe in divorce, but those are people that often, if they want their marriage to get better, can. So, you know, divorce um, is a big decision. You know, like getting married is a big decision. I think people need to take it more seriously and not just say, nah, let's get divorced. Do you find that people who get married, I mean, this is a strange question, but it, uh, I thought about it. Um, do you feel that people, when they get married, also think that potentially this marriage might not work, but they're going to do the best they can, the best they possibly can, but it takes a while to know that? Yeah, I hope when people get married, they feel that they're marrying an imperfect person, but they've accepted their flaws first of all but mostly it's let's say on a scale of one to ten you'd want a marriage to be between a seven or an eight tens rarely occur if you would go down to a four it doesn't stay there very long or a two um i think depending there are some religions that really frown upon divorce and i think that can cause its own difficulties i think it's important to go in going I mean, intellectually, we all know you can get divorced, but I think the commitment of trying to make it work, unless it was just from the beginning, the wrong reason. Often when people get married after a loss of a parent, they often aren't clear headed. And so those marriages tend to be more difficult in my experience. Um, but I do believe that if there was enough love and enough good stuff, and you might come see me and learn some tools to fill up your toolbox, that um, giving up too early can be the flip side of staying too long. Yeah. What are some of those tools in the toolbox without giving away all your secrets? Oh, no. I, I, those are the communication, caring, compromise, picking your battles, having friends, having a fulfilled life with your spouse, without your spouse. Um, enjoying the fact that if your spouse wants to go skiing for the day it's not anti you but it makes them happy even if you don't ski um, but also spending time spending time together is important and having those shared interests so in in my own life for instance about to celebrate my 35th wedding anniversary and of course there have been times where it's like hey what was i thinking but um we travel well together and have fun with both work we're both kind of workaholics. Um, I think finding, I always ask people this, which is interesting. So my answer for myself when I was 22 is the same as it is 62. So I always ask people like, if you had to create a person who had five attributes that you could not live without, what are those? 
and I don't mean like tall, dark, and handsome. Attractive is important to some people. And so it's very interesting what people put on that list. So for me at 22, surprisingly, psychological awareness was number one and still is. Because I feel like if you're married to somebody that can move within, you have a much better way of communicating conflict. But being what were the other four? Funny, what were the other four? <laughs> sometimes I joke the order would be different. Um, intelligent, ambitious. So psychologically aware, intelligent, ambitious, funny, and kind. Oh, those are great. Those are great. So what do you and what are some of the other combos that you've heard? Um, people do add attractiveness. People sometimes add um, financially stable, um, being a team member, adventuresome, um, trying to think. A lot of people put sense of humor on there. Like it's, it's fun to be married to somebody who makes you laugh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's interesting because somebody said this the other day. I mean, you're, you, you have this pocket of your own issues or your own your own way. And you're trying to kind of like fill that up with the good stuff from somebody else. And you're just trying to figure out that big, that big equation and how that works. But it's a it's a big kind of loose equation. And marriages again are complicated because they mimic parental marriages, also how your parents were communicating. And um, you know, I would say the biggest cause of divorce, truthfully, that I've seen in my office is couples that don't communicate or they don't communicate mindfully. And if there's a take home message from this is you really cannot take your words back. So I really impart that people think before they speak. Like yes. it's almost easier to get hit in the face, truthfully, than some of the stuff that I hear how people speak. Yeah, yeah, because that's a great, that's such a great point. We have another question that came in on my um, my text. We're told our we told our kids. This is from somebody. We told our kids that we are separating. They're begging us to stay together, but we're so unhappy. What should we do? Um, can, do you know how old the kids are? Twenties. Well, teens, late teens, twenties. Let's. Yeah. So I would first of all, I believe that the couple needs to tell the kids at the same time. So it's not good to hear from one and then the other. So I would be reassuring that nothing, that they're not divorcing the children or young adult children, that um, the relationship with them will stay the same, that without getting into details, and again, I do not believe in burdening why you're getting divorced as far as what happened, but that the two of you are not happy together as married people you think that you will co-parent and be friendly, this isn't gonna be a war, but that um, nothing will change with them and they won't be put in the middle. So that um, I would not encourage an unhappy couple to stay together for adult children. Yeah, that's a great answer. And the, the, the other thing is, um, what happens if a child, and then I'll let you, I, I want you to kind of summarize other things that you want to talk about, but my child, uh, someone's child is very aware and supportive of this person leaving, one person leaving that they've told. So what, what do they do? What does the mother or the father do? So and uh, they're afraid that they'll lose. Pardon me? They're, in other words, one child has talked with one parent they say, oh yeah, you should leave. It's terrible here. I mean, I can't imagine why would you want to stay? What do you do? How do you repair that in a family? How do you, and how do you gracefully that, divorce? That, so that can happen in two ways. So kids can pick up on tension. And if they're closer to one parent than another and they're 15 and they're like, how can you stay? It treats you fair. Again, I would say marriages are complicated and that's for me to figure out. If the parent told the child, you know, I think I'm going to get divorced, but the other parent's not involved. There's already a split. And one of those four things I said isn't, that doesn't do well because um, many kids, myself, I come from a divorced house. My parents were 15, but we kind of always knew. And truthfully, I was a much more content 
less anxious 15 year old once that happened because it, they didn't fight a lot there was just tension mm -hmm. uh, and so but i don't the biggest mistake in staying married or not staying married is when the family is split in half so yeah. you have one child i have one child so that can happen when we get thrown under the bus but even in families that have let's say two kids Parents have favorites, even if they tell you they don't, they do. And where families are divided. So I have a patient, I'm like, how's your husband, the younger one, you know, her son. And so they're often divided. So yeah. it started with me, she, the husband and the daughter were close and the son and she, were. and so now after therapy, it's a way better situation. That's great. So, what, do, you, do you think that's one of the reasons you, you became a, uh, a therapist yourself my parents got divorced yeah no but i think that i think people especially in psychiatry but a pie in any field of medicine in some ways we rescued ourselves but i entered therapy before i became a psychiatrist but when i was in eighth grade my friends and i would all analyze our house so people don't come out unscathed there were good parts about my childhood and not good parts and so i've been in, i was in therapy for decades which saved me. So I would say the first chunk was healing from wounds. And so often people come in and they think it's one parent and then you start to get to the other one and how things were. And then it becomes life. Like, who do you marry? Or do you want to get married? Or, you know, what do you want your life to be? Today I met somebody who's a better career. You know, so, um, and then it becomes like aging and raising kids. And in my case, running difficult cases by my own therapist who's a psychologist um, helped me. Um, so it's sort of like a whole spectrum of life. Um, so I'm 62, I started therapy when I was 23 for about 30 years minus a few, but the same person. And when I look back on my 22 year old self, I feel sorry for her. So you get enough distance yeah. so that you can see like, strengths but also like the anxiety or the pain that I felt. And and I have to ask, did you learn a lot by the way that your therapist was when you were the 23? Uh, uh, the therapy people get with me is the therapy I got, which is why I call it lovingly confrontational. So if you don't want to look at your own self and what you're contributing to your own unhappiness and difficulties, I am completely not the right person. So I can be incredibly loving and responsive and empathic, but you can't just blame everybody. So even if you, people have had horrible childhoods, I mean, just horrendous. And the resilience of people is amazing. But at some point, even if it affected you and you're closed off in a ball, at some point you slowly can open that and people feel safe with other people. So it's, um, you know, if you just wanna be a victim, and don't want to change and see that you can be empowered by change, even though it can be slow and scary. Um, sometimes people feel like there's a lot of power in being a victim. I would say there's no power in being a victim. And so, but it's all about timing and having people that want to, that recognize that they can change themselves, which will better their life. Yeah. That's saying a lot. Would you like to say anything else? I mean, you've said so much. Would you like to end with anything we've missed? No, I mean, I think the if anyone goes to therapy, um, there are great therapists out there, social work therapists, psychologists, psychiatrists, a lot of psychiatrists do only medicine. I actually won't do that because I like therapy. I think you also have to have I have somebody who I, she was taught me all about shared reality. So there has to be some sort of connection. You know, you can feel if there's like a mismatch, you can kind of, tip, not just with the issues, because there are certain issues I wouldn't treat because that's not my area of expertise. But it's, um, you kind of click. I feel fortunate. And I also think to be a good, um, psychiatrist or psychologist or social worker, you actually have to like people and you have to not be afraid to have some difficult conversations or have people mad at you or, you know, and so um, 
I happen to feel fortunate. I love what I do. I think when people choose in your career, there's sort of three bars. And so like passion for what you do, how hard you want to work and how important is it to make a lot of money. And so when I was becoming a psychiatrist, I was, psychiatry was the second lowest paid medicine to pediatrics. Um, but I loved what I did and I don't mind working hard. So people in my age group, we joke, we just did a residence month. <laughs> you know, I work 68 hours a week forever. But it's, um, yeah, yeah, I mean, if, you, if you're with somebody and you feel like they don't, like people or like what they're doing. Um, people can often tell if it's a good match. Yeah. Well, we're, well, you, we're, it's not a good match. You want people to get the help that they can. We are very happy you do what you do. Oh, thank you. We can't thank, thank you for enough for such a generous, generous, fantastic talk. Really, I'm so impressed. And I'm, I know our audiences as well. Thank you. Thank well, you. Thank you. Really? We, did re we did record tonight, so um, everyone who tuned in or registered will get a link. So if there's any part of this that you want to revisit um, or share with anybody that you think might be finding it useful, uh, you'll be able to do that as well. So thank you very much. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Dr. Judy. Thank you for having me. And thank you, Dan. And come to the Bedford Playhouse soon, right? Right, Dan? yes. Right? Maybe this weekend, yeah. Check That's out our website. Hope to see you there. Thank you. Have a good Thank night, you. everybody. Have a great night. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.